everyone. Happy Tuesday. Welcome, welcome. Hi. I love seeing everyone wave. Love seeing your faces. <laughs> welcome to the Nomadic Network. If that's, uh, you know, hopefully you're supposed to be here. Everyone's supposed to be here. Come on now. Um, welcome, everyone. I have Steve Brock with me. He's our special guest today. Super excited. We're going to allow a minute for people to figure out Zoom, get comfortable, get your drink. Um, while we're waiting, I'd love to know where you're calling in from. You can write that in the chat box. Utilize that chat. And in the chat, let us know how many TNN events you've attended. Is this your first? Is this your 54th? I'd love to know. How many do you want to attend? If this is your first one, welcome. If you are returning, welcome again. Let everyone file in. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Leah. I am the Los Angeles chapter leader. I also help Erica run these events for the Nomadic Network. And I am the co-creator and co-host of the Ticket to Anywhere podcast. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. You can watch us as well. <laughs> so excited to have you all here. All right, so before we get started with Steve, I am just going to share a few cool notes with you guys, with you all. All right, like I said, this is the Nomadic Network, you guys, welcome. We um, are a global network of travel enthusiasts. The only requirement is that you have to love travel, and we're started we launched in 22 cities across the globe about December of last year before COVID hit and we were, you know, making, gathering communities wherever we went. <clears throat> and then coronavirus put us on, <clears throat> excuse me, lockdown. So we've transferred to virtual events as has the rest of the world, but we still want to make these accessible and exciting for everyone. So it doesn't matter what time zone you're in, we try to make them in, in time zones that you can attend and you get um, a better mix, a larger mix of people, and you can network that way as well. So when you're in each city, you know, you can kind of only network with the people in that city, besides on the forums on the nomadicnetwork.com. But this is a great way for people to, you know, say hi in the chat, listen to speakers from all over the world, from different backgrounds. You know, we're not all only American, we're not all only in the US. So welcome to the virtual event side. Things to keep in mind. You can turn your camera on. We love seeing your faces. Uh, you will be muted for the duration of the event um, and we will have a Q&A that follows the presentation. Steve and I will chat about everything you want to ask him. So start your, your questions with the word question in the chat and I will grab them and we'll get them answered later. <clears throat> like I said, this is a place to um, fulfill your wanderlust, learn, connect with others. So use that chat. Like if Steve's talking about something and that reminds you of a story or a hot tip that you have, drop that in the chat because I guarantee you you're not the only person that wants to learn or has a question about what's happening or what's being talked about. So replays are available to Patreon members, patreon.com forward slash nomadic. Matt, I'll explain a little bit on the next slide. And our speakers, kind Steve, are doing this out of the goodness of their heart and all of the knowledge and the passion that he's gonna share with you today and we are forever grateful for that. So thank you so much, Steve. Now we do have a Patreon community, you guys. If um, <clears throat> you know, you want, if you feel that these events are providing you value and you want more out of them, we do have more. We have TNN event replays, personal stories. These are things that <clears throat> aren't shared on the nomadicnetwork.com. They're not shared on other public avenues. So this is pretty exclusive. Patreon community, you get live Q&As with Matt. Those are my absolute favorite. He literally answers every single question. You know, some free signed books, free guides, never before seen photos, uh, Facebook access to exclusive groups. This is the place to be y'all. So you want to know how to join this, you want more information, hold up your phone to the screen, open up your camera, scan it, and then a web page will pop up with more info. And if that's something that's not feasible, we are doing one-time donations via PayPal. So just hold up your phone to the right side of the screen and you can scan that for more info. <clears throat> so, oops, went a little too far there. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna introduce Steve really quickly and then I'll let him have 
the floor. So Steve Brock helps both new and experienced travelers to think differently about travel and not do the same old trips in the same old ways. Um, some of us like that, but you know, we want to try something new. So in particular, he encourage, encourages travelers to learn new ways co to connect with their interior life, your passions, your purpose, and your creative interests with their travel, fusing everything together. So in his forthcoming book, Hidden Travel, due out spring of next year, he explores how to find the hidden places and personal experiences that matter to you, not just those deemed popular by others. So he's traveled over 50 countries. Wow, what an accomplishment. I am not there yet. And when we're actually able to fly, he's on a plane every other week or two in his work running a branding agency in the Seattle area where he lives with his wife and favorite traveling companion. Yes, they are the same person. That is amazing. So Steve, without further ado, I will let you take the floor. Steve. All right. Thanks, Leah. I got to work on the, that one. That's good. I got the, uh, the hand gestures there going. All right. Well, I'm going to switch over here and jump into a slide deck. And we're going to go really, really super fast tonight because, um, as Leah mentioned, part of this is about how to connect the things you love most at home with how to, you know, apply those to your travels. So let me just jump on here and we'll get going. This is going to be, you know, they talk about drinking from a fire hydrant. This is going to be like drinking from Niagara Falls tonight. All right. So let's jump in here. Here's what we're going to be covering. This idea of starting with the end in mind, which is Thank you, Stephen Covey, but it's also good advice for any type of travel planning is figure out what you want to accomplish from your trip and work backwards from there. So we're going to talk about rethinking how to plan a trip around this idea of purpose, passion, and place. Rethinking how you travel with others. And uh, that is going to be kind of an interesting thing um, for a lot of reasons. So I'll get to that. Thinking in a different way about sustainability and how it can matter to you and how you can find your own approach your own sustainable sustainability, so to speak. We're going to look at rethinking empathy. How do you really connect with others in a time where that's so important to really understand how people who are very different from you, how you can relate there. And finally, rethinking your lenses, meaning how do you really learn from others who aren't travelers and how do you apply that to travel? Okay, so that's where we're going to go. Now, here's the thing. Start off here. Um, this is uh, what you're going to see if you go to this link here on exploreyourworlds.com slash resources. This is going to fill in your name and email. And the reason I'm pushing you toward this is there is a 15-page workbook that goes with this presentation. So that's how much information we're going to be covering. And it's going to be way too much for you to try to take notes on, your, on yourself. So you can get both a copy of the deck, the presentation here, and the workbook if you go here to exploreyourworlds.com slash resources, I feel like I should be saying, and call now for, um, but anyway, just do it because here's just an example of one, you know, set of pages from the workbook of just some of the stuff that you're going to find in there. So just trust me, it's worth it to, to sign up, get that, and you'll be a happier person. And then I won't have to talk quite as fast, but no, I'll still talk fast. Okay, here we go. Jumping into if you're going to rethink and you're um, planning a trip, because it's all about what you can do now at home to prepare for your next trip when you're able to take it. Okay, so it's about looking backwards to past trips and looking forward to new trips. So let's look with backwards first of all. Okay, so as we look at this, um, it's always fun with Zoom to try to move your little bar out of the way so I can actually read uh, what it says myself. So. Uh, you start by dissecting your past trips. You unpack a trip just like you do a bag. Go through your past notes, photos, journals, any conversations, anything like that. Because your goal here in looking backwards is to look for key memories and most of all, these peak or magical moments that you have or have had on a trip. Because what you're going to do is look towards those to understand what led to those so you can have more of those on a future trip, right? So this quote here, uh, Martin Buber, one of my favorite ones, it's kind of the, uh, the lead off. Leah mentioned the book. I'll show you the book. Here's the book. Okay, so it comes out. It's not available yet. But the reason also I should mention why I make you sign up for it, a lot of the things in here are in the book. And since the book's not out yet, it's nice to not have it out there on the web completely. But one of the, um, the leading quotes is this one is, all trips have their secret destinations of which the traveler is unaware. So you don't have to answer this in the chat because it probably would take up way too long. But think about that quote. What does it mean to you? 
Have you ever had that secret destination on a trip, something that occurred you never saw coming, okay? Because those type of things, when you look back on past trips, those are things you say, okay, I never expected that, and they're things you never will expect. But some are ones you can learn from and say like, oh, I'd like to see more of that on my next trip. Okay, those are gonna include these things like these, what I call seminal moments or turning points. Think about times on your trip that were those big turning points or events. For example, I remember I was in graduate school and I went to Asia for the first time in my life. I was uh, going and studying in Taiwan. And I remember getting off the plane there, find my own way, getting to the dormitory where I was gonna be staying and waking up the next morning thinking, you know, never been to Asia before, but now I know how to do it. I can do that. And it was just one of those little moments that you guys like, yeah, from that point on, um, any new country was never a problem uh, after that. So look at those, learn from those. Ask yourself, have you ever had like a purpose or a quest or a theme? We'll talk about those in a minute. Were they intended? Uh, in other words, did you intend to like find out like the best of, you know, soccer stadiums in Europe? Or did you just discover something and it became a quest or a theme or a purpose? So any of you, so go ahead and use this on chat. Has there ever been a trip? Do you plan a trip, not around just about, you know, exploration in the usual thing, but a key like purpose or a theme for that trip, like family related things, or maybe it was about a movie and you wanted to see a lot of people do that to New Zealand. They go, you know, looking for Lord of the Rings type of things. Any, any examples that you have of, of those? Okay. And all right. So anything here? Okay. All right, so keep those going if you have any other ideas on that, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, so think about those, any past quest, all that. And now, I wanna look about this in terms, of, that was looking back, now let's talk about looking forward in a, on a trip. So this, types, this relates to the same type of thing of um, what are the purposes or the passions that relate to a particular place. In the book, actually the subtitle of the book is Hidden Travel, The Way to More. And more here doesn't mean like more stuff. So be clear, it's not about consumerism or anything like that. It's more of what matters most to you. That may be more um, creativity, it may be more adventure, it may be more connections, it may be more joy, it may be more contentment. Whatever that more is for you, um, you are gonna find it when you connect purpose, passion, and place all together, okay? So let's look at some of those here. Hey. Leah, do you have, because it's not shown up with the presentation thing, any, you want to read off any of the, anything that looks good on the chat that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, Laura here said, Laura, travel 80 by 80, 40th birthday trip. Francois went to Portugal and decided that I will move there in a few years. That is so exotic. Uh, Lonnie, Savannah, Midnight and Garden of Good and Evil. There's so mm. many here. Claire Donnelly, Europe for a family wedding and love of World War II history. Uh, Steven Davila, Croatia for Game of Thrones and Paris for New Year's Eve. Um, oh, I can keep going. <laughs> uh, Jane, once I went to India, I realized that all the amazing festivals and rituals, they're all over the country. Um, Mia learned about educational systems in my, I can't pronounce this country, Myanmar, Myanmar. Myanmar. Yeah. Myanmar, Thailand, and Japan. Also the food, of course. Uh, just, Caroline. Just formerly Burma. It's much easier. Just Okay. There. <laughs> Caroline, getting to know a sushi chef in Tokyo restaurant, learning his tricks. Uh, Mav, surfing in the, I always want to say Maldives. Maldives? Maldives, yeah. I can't pronounce. Erica travels for weddings. Yes, we know. <laughs> yes. Each and every. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Erica's like a true wedding crasher, but like she knows everybody. So yeah. maybe not true wedding crasher. Yes. Tracy, her Ireland, because that's where her grandma was born. So um, saw where she grew up with her. Adam, Australia was a dream vacation of mine back in May of 2019. Okay. All right. That's great. And you guys nailed it. Those are the type of things where you actually have a specific purpose um, that you travel for. So let's look at that in a little more detail here. Um, Okay, so some things to think about in terms of purpose uh, for future trips. How can you add more purpose? Uh, one way to do it is, so uh, you can see this elsewhere. On my site, there's a, a, a quiz for what type of travel you are. And it's really helpful because uh, in this case, there's like, I think, five types. There's a beginner, there's a creator, there's an adventurer, there is a connector, 
uh, i.e. Eric. I think Erica's face should be there for the connector or traveler. Um, and then there is also the learner, okay? So everyone is usually one or a combination of those, but knowing that helps you determine what purpose you will have for your trip. With each trip, ask yourself what you want to accomplish personally. That may be you want to learn Thai cooking or you want to summit Mount Kilimanjaro or you want to um, have the experience of whitewater rafting, okay? Those may be personal goals you want to accomplish. There may be professional ones. You want to be a better writer. You want to be a more proficient photographer, if that's both personal and professional. You may want to learn how to just have better presence and things. These are things you can actually work on on a trip. The, the key theme to all of this is this notion of travel as a means, not an end. And for a lot of us, myself included, for years, I have treated travel as an end because it's a wonderful thing just to do, just to have travel on its own. But it can also be a great means towards one of these other goals. And think of travel as a learning laboratory where you can practice new personas, you can practice new skills, you can practice new activities in ways you can't always at home, okay? You can also ask yourself what you want to be or become. That could be a character trait. You want to be more adventurous, or maybe you want to be more patient, or maybe you want to be more outgoing. Whatever it is, those can be things you can practice on a trip as well. And what can you start working on now for each of these? While you're at home, what could you be thinking about? Like I mentioned Thai cuisine. You may not be able to go to Thailand right now, but you could at least be practicing you know, getting recipes off the internet and practicing those at home or finding um, uh, sources of the ingredients near you, okay? And then we talked about this, how you can use it more as a means to an end. All right, so more on purpose. Think in terms of themes. A lot of you already talked about some great themes there that you had. Um, one example of doing this is thinking like a photographer. You know, if in, for example, National Geographic photographers, when they go on an assignment, they already have in mind what the story is that they want to tell of the place. They don't go and say, okay, I just want to capture the highlights. They actually have a story and a theme behind it. The image you see here with, on the, the screen is actually from a trip I did with my um, son. He's in his 20s. He's a graphic designer. And we went to China a couple of years ago on the, with the theme of design. So everywhere we went, we were looking for it. Um, that meant going to cool galleries, cool um, cafes, museums, and just the, the architecture. Even seeing things like the roof tiles in China, we became more aware of that because we had this theme and it really informed us. We saw much more of China by having this theme than we would have if we'd just gone as regular kind of travelers or tourists. Think also in terms of quest, okay? This could be things like finding the best of an item or a place. I wanted to do this and we ran out of time. I want to actually, when we were in Paris, find the actual best baguette in Paris, which is a pretty uh, lofty goal given how many baguettes they produce there. But it could also be taking a photo of the best. It doesn't have to be you know, uh, a thing. It could be like the, the places known for the experiences there. Like you may want to find like in um, Seville, for example, uh, the best flamenco. It could be a special physical item you want to collect. So like behind me over here, I have these little physical things, these have been like a collection of like figurines or heads of people and stuff that were originally given to me as gifts. And now they kind of show up things we buy on a trip, or it could be like a virtual collection. Like I have probably, I don't know how many thousand photos of doors or windows or mailboxes or door knockers, things like that to become virtual collections. Those are things that can be part of the purpose of your trip. All right. And then you can also tie the, the accomplishments we talked about before to that as well. That's purpose. Now let's take a passion. Um, these are questions that are going to seem really obvious to you, but I want to challenge you because research shows that most of us don't actually know what we deeply love. Okay. So when I say to you what delights you, there's a good chance that you may give some idea of that, but not know what it is that most satisfies your soul. There is uh, this notion that in Italy, um, the Italians are really into passion. They'll you know, they may not care about their government or anything like that, but if you, you know, have the, the, if the penne pasta is slightly, you know, soft and not al dente, you have a riot on your hands, right? Because they're more about passion, where in the United States, they say that we're more about distraction, that we are easily distracted. We look for entertainment that distracts us, not, that, not these passions that really satisfy us. So just ask yourself in terms of figuring out where to go is like, understand what delights you, what moves you emotionally, what energizes you, um, what 
when do you enter flow, this notion of losing all sense of time and something that just really absorbs your full attention. What did you love doing as a child? It can really inform uh, what you love today. Similarly, how do you play? Play is a great way. Our mental defenses sometimes prevent us from thinking through these things kind of cognitively. And sometimes just in terms of what you do physically in playing will inform the things that you most love. Because um, when you know what you love, you can actually try to find that and plan trips around that rather than hoping to just have a good time on a trip. So here's one thing from an uh, initiative called the Pendable Strengths. What's one thing, not three things, one thing that answers these three questions? So think about this. What are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? And what are you proud of? So for example, I might say that I'm good at doing my taxes and I'm proud of doing it, but I hate doing it. So I don't enjoy doing it. So that wouldn't count. Or I might be good at, at video games and I am, and I enjoy doing it, but you know, at my age, it's like, yeah, I'm not exactly proud of it. Okay. But like photography, I would say I'm pretty good at it. I enjoy doing it and I'm proud of it. Okay. So find that one thing that works on all levels. And it really will, again, help inform you of the passion that you want to pursue on a trip. So you want to take that passion, that purpose, and then you want to find the place where you can practice that. So here's one thing to ask yourself. Again, a question that is seemingly simple, but I guarantee you that if you haven't done this before, it's going to be hard to answer this question, to really unpack what draws you to a place. What do you love? Is it the atmosphere? Is it the architecture? Is it the people? Is it the food? Is it just the sense of the histor historicity of the place. What is it that is the common theme for you, okay? And then uh, look at key, these key factors in choosing a destination. This is actually like a mini guide towards determining where you wanna go on your next trip. So factor in these things. You wanna look at your budget, obviously, how much can you afford? Uh, how far do you wanna go? Um, how much time do you have? But also a time is what time of year. Can you go and do you want to go? Because different places are better, right? Obviously, if you're going to south of the equator, you know, with the reverse seasons and everything, that's going to, if you have time off in the summer, that's going to put you potentially in the middle of winter down there. Um, what's the mood you're after? Are you going for adventure? Are you going for something that's more quiet and calming? Are you going for a relaxing trip? Are you going for more of a kind of a, a, a party scene or something like that? Mood is one of those really overlooked items in terms of choosing your destination. Same with type of place. Do you like mountains? Do you like beaches? Do you like deserts? Do you like forests? Do you like big cities? Do you like being in nature? Understand what you really, what type of place you really like and use that as a, as a guide here. Same with personal interests. We talked about that. What are those passions, those interests, those hobbies? Um, what are your bucket list uh, items? And how can you let these other factors, you know, help you select the ones on your bucket list that you can accomplish now? So for example, you may have a uh, bucket list, but you can't obviously do it uh, if it's like overseas in some countries right now with COVID, but you could actually choose the bucket list that may be here domestically and choose those things. Are there friends you want to go with, friends you want to meet overseas? Is there a language that you want to learn? Do you want to go someplace where English is spoken everywhere, like Australia? Do you want to go where it's spoken most places, like say Norway? Do you want to go in places where it's spoken a little bit, like say Ecuador? Or do you want to go someplace where no one speaks English because you really want that challenge like Outer Mongolia, right? Food, easy one, right? For you want to build a trip around food. You want to look at the distance that you're going, not only in terms of how far it is, but also the environmental impact. In other words, a lot of us, and we're going to talk about this in a minute on sustainability. It's like, I'm really starting to question a lot of the trips I'm taking and whether I should be doing those. So know that ironically though, sometimes distance isn't the same with the environmental impact. A long trip actually burns less carbon uh, emissions than a bunch of shorter trips do, uh, or a, a trip to a destination with a lot of stopovers. So that may be something to factor in, or even transportation choices. What you want to, you know, you want to take a train, you want to be on a ferry, you want to, you know, hitch a ride on a freighter, whatever. Are there events like uh, f festivals or, uh, you know, even, um, uh, even things like we have coming up, it's in April, I believe, is TravelCon. So that's a thing is to say is like, right, can I do TravelCon in New Orleans and then build a trip around that in the South? I could go to other places in Louisiana or in the South there as well. Build that around there. Then do you want to go to popular places or not popular? I'm seeing that in most of the overpopulated or overpopular places today where we have over tourism, um, it's not being helpful. And so one way is to actually go where place, places which aren't popular 
to actually address this overpopulation. Are other factors that choose a place? You get the idea. Okay. Moving on. Oh, yeah, sorry, last thing. Where can you go locally that's going to help you connect with pur purpose and passion? All right. So um, just think about that because there are ways to travel right now um, that you don't have to wait for later to do. All right, that's purpose, passion, and place and connecting all of that. Now let's look at this issue of who do you travel with? Um, this is a quote from the book. The right traveling companion can uh, make a bad place fun. The wrong traveling companions can make a great place miserable. All right, raise your hand if you've ever had that experience, right? Of being someplace that you think this should be the best place in the world and you're with someone that is just wearing you down, right? Okay, so what can you do about that? Here's one way to rethink about traveling companions. Obviously the easiest way of all, travel solo, right? But um, that, and that has its benefits, but let's go further into if you're gonna go with someone. You'd be amazed how many people I, I talk to about trips who have had a bad time. And the reason for it with their traveling companions, they never talked about the trip other than the logistics of it before. They never talked about their interests. They never talked about all these different things. Talk through it. Be very open and very candid with people or with your uh, traveling companions. I will tell you this, probably applies to most of you as well, is I have so many really, really good friends that I know I can never travel with. Because a best friend at home may not be your best friend on a trip. So think that through. Um, practice. You know, before you head off for a month and a half with a person on a trip through Asia, practice on a short trip first. So you get to know their, their kind of idiosyncrasies. I love this advice I got before I got married, which was this. A person said to me, whatever you love about the person you're thinking of marrying will only get better. And whatever you dislike will only get worse. And you better be sure that you can live with the little things you dislike because that person is not going to change, okay? And that applies equally well to your traveling companion. So get used to, the, be sure you can tolerate uh, the things, the little um, irritants there because they're not gonna get better on a trip. So ask these questions. How long will you be traveling together? You can put up with a lot for a month, or sorry, for a week or two. Get to a month or more and those little irritants are gonna become big irritants. Um, do you have a shared uh, passion or interest? That'll overcome a lot of the differences that you have. And also this issue of difference, is that the issue? I have seen this more times than not that it's not traveling with a person that is very different from you that causes the problems. It travels, it's traveling with a person who is actually more like you and you end up pushing each other's buttons because you actually have a lot of the same kind of bad habits. All right, know your differences. Here's some to think about. Are you introvert and is the other person an extrovert? Mm, can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Do you like the indoors and they like the outdoors? Same thing, you can find a balance or you can drive each other crazy. Are you going to uh, for a restful vacation or are you going for activities? This one guaranteed will mess up uh, a travel arrangement if, you don't, if, you're, if you're not on the same page on that one. Um, art versus sports, again, can be, you can work it out, a little time for this, a little time for that, or it can be a problem. Um, do you live to eat or do you eat to live? Because if you have different appreciations for food and how you approach it, that can be a real issue. If you want a three hour meal in this fine restaurant and the person you're with wants to go to McDonald's. All right, do you like to take risks and try new things or you like the fact that there is a McDonald's right around the corner? Um, everyone has a budget, but some, but that's a very subjective thing and you better know what your budget mindset is and the person you're going with. Because if they say, yeah, I'm a budget traveler and I won't stay in, you know, I don't believe in staying in five-star hotels, but four-star, yeah, I can, that's kind of my thing. It's like, oh, great, yeah. Um, anyway, are you a planner or are you spontaneous? Again, they can work out, but they can also cause problems. And again, exotic versus familiar, same thing as kind of above. This one is a good one. You can travel with a person that's more seasoned or experienced than you if you're a first timer, and it can be a wonderful learning experience for both, or it can be a grading experience. So it all depends on the people. And then here's a deal breaker. If you're a morning person and your travel companion is a night person, ne'er the twain shall meet. You are not gonna have a good trip in most cases because it's really hard to balance that one out. So know ahead of time. Um, okay, what's the one here about care about uh, fitting along versus don't care at all? Good point. 
again. You know, and, and that also leads, there's a whole bunch of ones. Another one of that is cultural sensitivity, right? Are you sensitive to how other people perceive you as an American, for example, if you're an American? Um, and the other person is like, I don't care. You know, I'm just here to have fun. Mm, it could be a problem. All right, let's go on here. Let's talk about sustainability. It's a big topic these days, for, rightly so. So years ago, um, I spent a decade almost at the international uh, NGO uh, World Vision. It, it's one of the largest, in fact, I think it's the largest privately funded international relief and development organizations in the world. And so this issue of sustainability has been something I've been interested and passionate about for, gosh, a couple of decades now. But it's not as simple as simply um, being responsible in terms of things like uh, you know, the environment. That is a key piece of it, but it goes beyond that. So when people are out there talking about sustainability, listen selectively to what they really mean by that. Learn your own sustainable sustainability, which means this, uh, work towards building sustainable habits rather than one-time efforts, okay? You want something that you can continue, whether you're on a trip and then you come home or vice versa. So you're really working sort of towards this as a habit or a lifestyle. That's where it's gonna really be most helpful rather than just do one little thing here or there, okay? And don't get overwhelmed, right? Start small. So you've had some great speakers on this topic uh, already. So I'm not gonna take time to go into all that. I'll let you read some of these things here. Um, but the one that has been most kind of eye-opening for me, and I think, um, Maria Elena, you're on the, the thing today. I saw your name pop up there. So this is kudos out to Maria Elena Smith on, uh, on epic7travel.com. Go to there on her list of travel essentials um, and, and sustainable travel essentials. It is so amazing the things that you don't even think about like, oh my gosh, you're right. Uh, the, the convicting one for me is like Ziploc bags. You use them all the time traveling and now I'm realizing it's like, oh, you know, those things aren't exactly recyclable. So uh, I found out two days ago, found out a great source of biodegradable Ziploc bags. And I wouldn't have done that except for Marie Lena's um, post here. So go there and take a look, try these different things that you can do about sustainability. Now, in addition here, if my screen will work, there we go. Um, sustainability, as I mentioned, isn't just about the environment. That's a huge piece of it. But if you look at the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, you can see that number 13, climate action, or 14 and 15, life below water, life on land. These are things that are actually key parts of it, but so is um, poverty and zero hunger, these things. So I mentioned at World Vision, uh, we would constantly have this dilemma of people who are living in abject poverty that needed to clear land for a farm for just sustainable living there. And then you have uh, some pretty radical environmentalists who would say, it's like, no, they can't do that um, because they're gonna you know, kill the trees and stuff. It's like, you gotta find a balance. So find the balance that works for you. And here's kind of almost as a quest for you. Find one of these areas that you get excited about and you can learn about that. And so um, go in and just kind of see the areas, um, study this, and find what works to you, and then you can pursue these type of things on your trip as well. They can be part of your, your goals. All right, that's on sustainability. Let's look at uh, empathy, another popular topic these days. Um, all right, so article a while back. Actually, Matt sent this out. It was on one of his emails. So he, he forwarded this article that, about National Geographic saying, does travel actually make you more empathetic? And there was, their response was, no, it does not, okay? Which was kind of a downer. So I'm gonna counter that. I don't think it does, just like I don't think it makes you more open. I don't think it makes you more respectful. I don't think it makes you more enlightened unless you do so in an intentional manner, right? You're not gonna become more creative by just traveling overseas. Research doesn't support that. If you travel overseas though, and you're seeking to be more creative and more open, it will definitely make you a more creative person. Same thing with empathetic, but with being more empathetic, okay? The good news about this is that empathy is a skill you can learn, all right? And you can practice it. Here's the cool part. You can learn things here at home that you can then practice overseas, and you can learn things in a way you can never do at home overseas that you can then practice here. We live in a time where we need empathy to understand and appreciate each other more than ever here at home. Use travel as a way to build that up, okay? 
A lot of people talk about this idea of lived experiences. If you haven't actually lived it out, um, it doesn't count. How many of you guys have ever had someone tell you this? Like you come home for, for, from a trip and you just said, oh man, I was just down in, in you know, uh, wherever. I was in Ghana and I had this great time. And they said, do you have a picture of it? And you say, uh, yeah, somewhere, but not with me. And they said, well, that I don't really believe you went there. It's like, what? But it is the kind of idea is like if you can't prove it or if you haven't lived the experience, um, it doesn't count. Well, empathy is actually the opposite of that. Empathy says is you don't have to have lived it to be empathetic to that person. Uh, I was a theater minor in, in college. And I remember uh, one of the classes, uh, there is this story of a director who said to this actress, she said, I, my character is supposed to play a murderer and being a method actor, I believe, and having the experience of doing things to know it, but I'm not gonna go out and kill somebody just to be a better, you know, play this role. And he said, you don't have to, that's going too far. He said, have you ever swatted a mosquito in anger? And she said, yeah, of course, I hate those things. And she, he said, great. Then you've had the same emotion that you need to, to understand what that character feels with murder. And it's the same thing for us with empathy. We don't have to have lived experience. We can understand from our own experiences if we will be open to that and pay attention to uh, people. So here's a key point. This one is hard. These next two are kind of hard for a lot of us. Your empathy comes easiest out of your brokenness, okay? You can understand a person a lot better when you can relate to the struggles that they have had coming out of your own struggles in life, okay? Same thing on a trip. You will connect with people far more out of your humanity than you ever will out of your competency. How many of you guys have had that thing where you are totally lost or something like I was in Greece when a moped totally broke down and this guy out of nowhere came and helped and it, it, he would never have come up to me. We would never have connected had I just been riding the moped and everything was fine, right? So it's when we are most in need that sometimes we really connect and we learn empathy and we learn how to relate to others, okay? So remember that. It's not your expertise that's gonna get you uh, by in a lot of places, particularly overseas. It's gonna be your ability to show that you need help because it, research shows that people actually enjoy helping others when they know that they're in need, okay? This is a quote I had from a client once. He told all of his salespeople this. He said, learn to be more interested than interesting. And that's kind of the opposite message that we get here. It's always about like, oh, you know, let people know how interesting you are and, and, and how deep and how kind of, you know, all these things about you. And it's like, nah, that's not going to be a way to, to build the bridges here. Be more interested in them than showing how interesting you are. Okay, with this, probably in the 50s, the 1960s, the most precious resource we had was money in our society. Then it started to shift towards uh, most precious resource was time. And today, it's attention. It's the thing that most of us cry out for, right? Who doesn't want to be seen? Who doesn't want to be heard? Who doesn't want to feel like they are known? So giving people your attention is the, one of the best things you can do. And ways to do it are um, a couple ways. You can practice non-verbally by this. Go to this link here, and again, it's in the notes. Um, and take this quiz. This quiz is fascinating. It shows you these, um, you know, just the eyes of a person, which is pretty much all we see of each other anyway with a mask on these days for COVID. But uh, like for this, there's 37 of these faces. And in each one, you're given four choices. Does this reflect jealousy? Is this person panicked? Is this person hateful? Or is this person arrogant? And then you have to choose. So 37 of those, I think the average score is somewhere around 60%. Um, so meaning that most of us only are, get six out of 10 type of these things right, which means we got some work to do in terms of understanding and reading people. But it's a great way, particularly when you travel overseas and you can't communicate with the words to really be able to understand the expressions because these actually are pretty universal how people look, okay? Another way is to look at verbally. About, in the, about 50 years ago, um, researchers came up with these 36 questions that you can ask. And what they found was that uh, they will build intimacy even with strangers. So about a decade ago, New York Times had an article about how to make a person fall in love with you. And they, they kind of resurrected these 36 questions. And it works pretty well. In fact, the research shows that if you practice these 36 questions, 
you may know more about a person in, in 15 to 30 minutes than you do about the people you've grown up with all your life because you're able to go deeper. And here's the secret of it. And this is a secret for empathy and for getting to know people when you travel is reciprocity, meaning it's like you don't just ask questions. You ask questions so that they ask questions and you move deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. So even if you take a look at the ones shown here, for example, you see in set one, you know, would you like to be famous in what way? That's a pretty surface level question, but even set two, and there's, as you can see, this is only half of them, is what's your most treasured memory? Now you're getting more personal. And by the time you get down to the set uh, three, and so it gets much more uh, intimate. Great thing, great research to know. All right, so last thing here to look at is this. Rethink your lenses. What do I mean by that? It's how we see the world. It's how we interpret it and how we learn. And um, one of the ways you can do this is rethinking how you think about travel from the sources of uh, how you think about travel. So rather than turn towards other travelers, think about other disciplines. So let me give you a couple that are you know known to me, for example. Since I mentioned working as a branding person and working with corporations and nonprofits in the world of brand, um, here's what I've learned from that. Focus on what you love most. In market research, you will go out and you will try to find out every dimension there is around a product. You know, do people like the smell? Do you like the taste? Do you like the looks? Do you like the packaging? Do you like the price? With brand research, it's very different. You're not looking for all these attributes. You're looking for what people love most about a product, a service, or an organization. It's the same with travel. Instead of trying to figure out all these different little things about a place and trying to become like an expert on it, find out the things that you love most, and here's the key, and then try to help those that you meet to love that as well, okay? This idea of appreciative inquiry, it's a business practice which says instead of going into a company and try to understand what are the problems so they can fix it, you go in and you find out what gives hope. What brings people hope? What gets them out of bed in the morning? What gets them to show up? And you take that same approach as you go and travel is to say like, okay, what are the great things about this place? So you're constantly focusing on the positive. It's not a kind of Pollyannish, like, oh, everything's wonderful here, but it is really more of just being more appreciative about what is good there. Also comes with scientists. Okay, now at this one, I'm gonna get, I get me in trouble sometimes, but I guarantee you that um, it is something worth considering, if nothing else. So the Hawthorne effect is this. It says that any group that is being monitored or evaluated, um, the monitoring of that will actually change the behavior of the people being watched, okay? So most of us that are on here, I, I'm pretty sure, uh, want to go for an authentic travel experience where we understand exactly what the locals are experiencing. Just the fact of your presence there will ensure that it is not a truly authentic experience, okay? This is why I said I get in trouble for saying that, but it's kind of true. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be a huge change, but it will have some of it. But here's the point. It doesn't matter because instead of trying to be this insider, which you will never be, um, embrace your role as an outsider. Embrace the role that you have of going into, I have done this so many times, so many places where I will ask a local that I've met and say, do you realize just how beautiful this street is that you live on? And they will say, they will start off and saying, it's like, oh, this is my old neighborhood. This is horrible. It's like nothing changes here. And you start pointing out, no, look at the architecture, look at the light, look at just the feel of this place and everything. Don't you realize that? And pretty soon as the outsider, you are able to bring something of great value to them that they couldn't see on their own, okay? Filmmakers, here's another way to, to rethink what you, how you approach travel. Instead of just what you can learn about a place, think of telling the story of that place as a filmmaker would do. If you were to make a movie of the place, what would it, that story be or what would be your story in that place another helpful way i used to be a magician okay full disclosure in college and then afterwards yes stop laughing erica i yes i worked as a professional magician for <laughs> okay that's laughing just way too much um and so one of the things you learn as a magician is this idea of a willing suspension of disbelief but i think you can learn from magicians in this sense as all of us living in this country today with everything going on is we get pretty jaded and we get pretty cynical. And so um, our tendency is to kind of uh, 
take that approach as we uh, approach new places. So what I'm saying here is from magician, you can learn to choose wonder over cynicism. Um, uh, Peter Turchi in his book, Amazing and Muse, talks about uh, the difference between a mystery and a puzzle. A mystery is something you can, or sorry, a puzzle is something you can solve. A mystery is something you cannot. Logistics on a trip are a puzzle, right? You want to solve them. But understanding what makes uh, that, that wonderful location where you're having this wonderful picnic so special, that's a mystery. You don't have to solve that. You can, you can choose the wonder of it rather than trying to solve it. And finally, the last point relates here is be like an artist or a po poet. Unless you're a, um, a anthropologist or you are a journalist, you don't need to go to a place to try to figure it all out. You do want to be informed because the more you know, the more you can be appreciative of it. But travel instead to be inspired by the place, okay? Travel to appreciate rather than just to analyze it. Because I know a lot of us, particularly those of us who do travel writing, we kind of feel this obligation to understand a place and communicate the depths of it. But there's more to it than just being, you know, informed and analyzing it. You can be inspired by it so that you can really find what moves you about it. So here's the reason why it's also important. When I was in China, there was this quote I heard from other expats, which was this. So I lived in China for a year. And um, they said, if people come over to China for a week and they go home and they write a book, they come over for a month and they go home and they write an article and they come over for a year or more and they write nothing because they realize how little they understand of the place. All right. And I think that's true is you don't have to understand it just to appreciate it. Okay, that's it. Question time here. Sorry, I know it went covered a lot of stuff, but any questions? No, this is fantastic, Steve. Um, let me, did you have a contact slide? Sorry if I missed that. Otherwise, I can drop how Probably. everyone can get in contact with you unless Erica can do it faster than I can. <laughs> no, you can do, yeah, sorry. It's mostly it's going here. Explore. There you go. Or you can do it, you can get me on everything, I think, is uh, at Meaningful Trav, like on Instagram, but um, and Twitter and stuff that I'm not really on Twitter all that much. So Instagram, those at Meaningful Trav, which was short for Meaningful Traveler, but no one ever gets that too much. So it just sounds stupid. I'm going to yeah. drop that in. No, thank you. This was very deep. It was very enlightening. <laughs> there were a lot of things that myself and I'm sure everyone else hadn't considered before, hadn't thought of, um, just a way to travel better and connect, like you said, our purpose and our passions with travel. Yeah. Dustin said lots of great information. People are already going to your website, which is awesome. I know Mav took your test to find out what kind of traveler wow. he is, which is super cool. Um, everyone, I just dropped how you can connect with Steve there, but definitely explore your world. You saw throughout the presentation how many resources he has on the website. So that's just go ahead and head there first. <laughs> um, so Steve, tell us a little more about your book that's coming out next spring. Thank you. Well, it's about basically what we covered. It's about how to pursue this idea of more using travel as a means to find the things that matter most to you. And so it looks at different aspects of it. So the, the title of hidden travel means that most of the things that are important to you aren't always going to be overt. They're hidden and you have to hunt them down a lot of times and be really intentional about it. Um, it does deal with hidden places, but it's also things like hidden emotions, hidden joy, all these different aspects that don't always come to the surface unless you go looking for them. And so it's about how to find that in any type of travel that you do, but it also explores um, things like the hidden dimension of time. Uh, I would say that's one of the biggest things that most travelers overlook is we may look at it from a standpoint of like slow travel. And I think there's a growing movement, particularly now coming out of, of COVID for that, which is awesome because from a sustainability standpoint, as well as just a personal enjoyment standpoint, it's good. But it's also issues of time like spending time in one place long enough, almost to the point of getting bored there. It's the same thing with creativity. Great creativity comes out of boredom or out of giving yourself nothing to do 
long enough for you to actually clear through and get the ideas you didn't have before. So time works that same way. Biggest concept there is this idea, the difference between the Greek concept of Kairos time and Kronos time. Kronos time is the time that we are used to, which is like clock time. Kairos time is about like moments. So if I say, um, what time does the party start? That's Kronos time. If I say, uh, did you have a good time at the party? That's Kairos time. And traveling in Kairos time, I guarantee you change how you think about travel in ways that you probably never thought about before. That's just one of the points there. That's awesome. And where can we get your book besides your website or is it only on your website or can it's we pre-order? Yes, pre-order. Because of COVID, the publishers moved it back to um, April 1st. So on April 1st, I mean, I think it's up on Amazon and different places now for pre-order, but for the most part, it will be available on, in spring on all the usual, any place that you normally get your books. Okay. Wonderful to hear. That's so exciting. All right. We had a few more great questions um, roll in. So I'm going to start with this one from April. Once you figure out what kind of travel you enjoy, how do you figure out what places are the best match for you? Oh, that's an awesome question. Um, you start doing research in a different way by, by looking at the, the common factors that made those places interesting to you. And then you start saying, okay, if it, it happens to do with, like, so for me, I've come to realize that as a photographer, the visual appeal is really a strong characteristic. So I, my wife and I were just talking about, we love Costa Rica, but we love Nicaragua even better because uh, Costa Rica doesn't have the architecture. And that's a whole long story of why that Nicaragua does. So find those things that are known for the things that you love most. And then start using the other factors on that list of the destination things to start, you know, how much time do I have? So, for example, if I want to get to someplace in Uzbekistan, but I only have a week, not going to happen. Just, it just you use your whole entire time just getting there. So use those to, to whittle down and prioritize what matters most. Cool. That's awesome. Okay. Love it. Um, I love that you mentioned Nicaragua because I feel like it's incredibly underrated. And I've actually been to that country more times than any other country outside of the U.S., which is weird because it's like, Nicaragua, what? I have a very special connection, emotional connection to Central America. So yeah. I love that you mentioned that. Okay, woo, now we got some great questions rolling in. Um, fun, easy one. Laura wants to know, what's the next trip that you are planning? Oh, uh, don't ask. I don't know. I'm honestly, I'm, I am learning contentment for local travel right now and kind of focusing on that. And so um, David Farley that was on here a while back on travel writing, I loved his response when, for an article uh, I asked him about. And he just said, I am learning to just really enjoy the present moment and not thinking so much about it because we don't know what it's going to look like. So I'm kind of doing the same thing is just learning from that and not a good answer for everybody because for some people having that dream destination is going to get you through this time. Mm -hmm. So totally get that. But for me, I don't know actually right now. Oh, right. The, the one on the horizon, we have some friends who are moving to Uganda uh, next in November. And so th that's one possibility is going and visiting them next when we can. Wow. Okay. Um, since you're in Seattle, do you cross the border to go to Canada or wait, are we closed to Canada? Yeah. 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 Can we we you are. Yeah, you can't really do it right now. Mm. Not yet. So no. Summer. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, this is a great one from Dustin. Since this is meaningful travel, Steve, yeah. do you have a purpose statement that drives your travel? Um, not in specific words, but I would say, having thought about this a lot, that it relates to almost the platonic. I know, I know it's going to sound really like wonky, but it relates almost to the, the idea of beauty, truth, and goodness that is to pursue that. And to it's not just to pursue that, it's to bring that every place I go. Because there's a lot of stuff we've talked about today is all about, you know, finding what matters to you. But I guess a key theme in the book is ultimately what's going to make you most happy and joyful and satisfied of when you're uh, helping other people to discover the things that matter to them. And the more that you can do that and bring that with you um, when you travel, so whether that's beauty, whether it's truth, whether it's goodness, um, I think you're gonna have a better trip and they're gonna have a better experience too. That's so lovely to hear. I can't think of the right adjective for it, but it makes me feel 
it's like an exhilarating way to think of it, bringing mm. beauty, truth, and goodness everywhere you go. Mm. Um, great. So let's see. I want to jump to, oh, oh yeah, I want to jump to David's question because I was going to ask this right after you mentioned traveling with your wife. But um, besides your favorite traveling companion, your wife, do you travel primarily solo or with others or do you have a preference? So um, most of my travel, so international travel takes up maybe, I'm down to maybe a month, a year in a normal, like last year was maybe six weeks total. Um, but I'm also on an airplane every other week, which means I travel a lot domestically for work and that's all solo. And what I try to do and tell all business travelers is this, same thing I was mentioning with TravelCon, find ways to build in personal adventures on your business trips everywhere you go so that you're able to like carve out, even if you can't stay an extra night, which sometimes you can, but, uh, but even if you can't get out of your hotel in the evenings, even though you're dog tired, you will be more energized by getting out and wandering in the neighborhoods around your hotel or other places in town than you will by, by sitting there and, and clicking through, you know, cable television and stuff like that. So um, that didn't answer your, oh, solo. Uh, sometimes I do. Uh, last year, was it? Two years ago, I had a business I, uh, work I had to do in Turkey and I took extra four or five days, did solo travel through Cappadocia and it was awesome. And I miss, I miss the solo travel, but, um, I would also miss my wife if I did that all the time. So you, you guys all know this, right? That happy wife, happy life. So I remember saying <laughs> to a person. Happy spouse, happy house though. <laughs> well, actually, you know, here's, here's the thing. Here's, I'm not even in a relationship. Like I'm in no relationship. All right. All right. So here, here's the other one though. Is um, if mom's happy, everyone's happy. And if dad's, no, if mom's not happy, nobody's happy. And if dad's not happy, nobody cares. So just thought I'd leave that one as well. <laughs> well, I think you have um, a few years of wisdom on me, so I'm just not going to argue with that, right, to be right. honest. Okay, so Jane asked an important question because I think you got us really thinking about traveling companions. Do mm. you have talking points? I mean, I know you mentioned quite a few, but do you have any other important or first things that come to mind when it comes to talking points to address for potential traveling partners? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that list of are you this or this, use that as the list. Literally go through that and talk through each one of those. Here's how I learned it. When this is probably a dozen or so years ago, we went, my parents had a timeshare in Hawaii. So my wife, two sons, and I and my parents went to Hawaii together thinking that we're a family. We know each other. We've grown up together. And the second day on the big island, um, we drop them off to walk and we go down the beach and they eventually come back from the walk an hour later and say, okay, we're ready to go now. And we said, well, that's we're, we're, we're here for, you know, it's the beach. We're here for another, you know, six, seven hours. We're all camped out, got everything. And they said is we hate beaches. Why would we want to spend time here? I'm thinking, <laughs> who are you people? Like, how did I grow up not knowing you hate beaches? And so from that moment on, I mean, that literally caused a huge, you know, clash between us and we didn't know it. So the next year, my aunt passed away, and she, her, one of her last wishes was, was that we would go visit the family castle in Scotland, which really means like, you know, generations back. And so my mom and I talked through it, and we went through really super hard discussions like, you do this, you do this, you do this, and it drives me nuts. And she said the same thing. It was the best conversation. We had an awesome trip as a result. Talk it through. Talk yes. every possible issue you can through. Yes, I know there's an example. I dropped in an example that I plan to go with a friend from work and we're great friends. And then the second I mentioned hostels, which was pretty early on, she's like, whoa, whoa, no. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, never asking you on a trip again, ever. Yep. And it actually yep. kind of changed our friendship dynamic, unfortunately, but yep. um, it's okay. <laughs> Erica, Erica asks, who hates beaches? Erica, there are people that don't like sand. That's, That's why it. they hate beaches. Because they it. don't not like the water. They don't like sand. Yep, yep. I know. I know. <laughs> People Still say that swim. all the time. Mm -hmm. yep. Or they can't swim. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. So let's see. Caroline wants to know, what will you need in order to feel like overseas travel is possible for you beyond the government related restrictions because of COVID? Hmm. This is, you know, there's, everyone has this idea of being a risk accepting versus a risk adverse person. And I think it really comes down to that 
But here's the thing is, it has to be, if you are traveling with someone else, you have to understand their risk tolerance as well, right? So that's gonna be a, a dialogue that you have to have. I don't really know. I think there's gonna be a general vibe of when we're all gonna start feeling a little bit more comfortable with it and, and what our risk is. I'm starting to sense it already as you start to see some of the COVID rates drop a little bit, but that could be too soon as well. So it's gonna be a myriad of factors. I can't answer that. Yep, you can only speculate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I'm so sorry, Steve, but I have to jump off. Yep. Um, yep. I'm going to pass the torch to Erica. It was fantastic speaking with you. Thank you for all the questions. Everyone else, make sure Erica will drop in his contact info again. If your question isn't answered, be sure to reach out to Steve directly. Definitely head to his website for all those cool resources. Thank you again, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, Leah. Wonderful. I'm Erica. Just in case this is your first time, I help run the Nomadic Network with Matt and Leo is helping me tonight, which I'm so grateful for. Um, we have one last question for, from Adam who says, uh, would you choose a bucket list destination or many small trips throughout the year instead? So it's like a, would you rather? So here's an interesting thing. The research on psychology shows that two things, that the best part of your trip are, is the anticipation before a trip and then reflection on it afterwards. I mean, that's what the research shows, okay? So there are some uh, psychologists who will have theorized that if you want to enjoy and just pure happiness, plan multiple small trips because you will have more doses of anticipation in that and the dopamine that comes from that. So that's one thing to factor in on that. I have actually moved toward that mindset a little bit more of the smaller trips and just enjoying those um, until I can have a bigger trip that, because I'm trying to practice what I preach here on the purpose and until I can really understand what it is that drives me on the bigger things. I don't want to just do another trip the way I've always done it before. So we're really, really working hard and figuring out, okay, what is it that's going to be the most meaningful type of big trip? Um, and that will justify, again, trying to be really um, careful about the sustainability issue, environmental issue. What's going to justify getting on that plane um, for a longer trip? Yeah. Plus, the, the small ones you can do locally. That's another piece of it as well as you don't have to go as far, far on the small ones. See, now I have a problem with the small trips because sometimes I feel like I forget about them. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I feel like the, these long trips are like really nice because they are substantial in my, you know, memory. But like these two, three day trips, like sometimes I feel like two or three years later, maybe I dream that up. Well, no, here's the thing. So we ask about the book. The key, key theme of the book is this idea of traveling in moments, which means that you actually strive to either find or even create these magical or defining moments. Um, that stand out, that you, the ones you remember your rest of your life. And I guarantee you, you can have those on a small trip. The problem is most of us don't want to put in the effort to try to create what it takes to create a meaningful or a magical moment on a small trip. We just kind of go with the flow. And that's fine, but they don't stand out in your memory then as a result. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, that that is actually the key because now that you're saying that, I'm thinking of the one day or the day and a half that I spent in Turkey when I was 18. And that was super memorable because a local took me around and took me to his house and had me meet all his friends and to his airplane hangar, which I don't know why he owned an airplane <laughs> hangar full of art, but he did. And that really sticks out. So I get what you're saying completely. And I'm so looking forward to your book, Steve. Oh, I want to say that was our last question. So I sort of want to say thank you. I will definitely let you download the chat. You guys, if you want to download the chat at all, um, you could press the three dots right next to the chat and you can save it. Um, but Steve, there's tons of compliments in here for you. So I feel like you should read this with a good cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I know you haven't been watching the comments, but they've been really great. Um, you guys are incredible. I definitely put the wrong, um, the wrong link in here. So I'm just going to drop it again. You guys, this is a free workbook. I put workshop, of course, because I'm reading and typing. Um, but get this free workbook because it's got all, well, Steve, do you want to say again what it has in it so that everyone can go ahead and 
get it's, grab it it's off basically your it's, it's all the detail behind the um, presentation. So on things like the it, it's it's literally like worksheets on your passion and things that that matter to you. It goes into more detail on um, all the stuff. Uh, that, that we covered. So it just has that there. The, the, again, that thing on the destination guides, how to figure out the destination, uh, a lot of that, and a lot of links. I think that's the main thing that's helpful is the links to that 36 questions or to the empathy, you know, the reading type of thing. That, that's all there as well. Perfect. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to you. And then I have a few um, outgoing announcements. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly so that I could share them with all of you guys. Um, let me see. My computer always moves a bit slow when everyone's watching it. <laughs> Tell me when, give me a thumbs up if you can see my, my slide. Okay, great. Wonderful. So in the beginning, I saw that there were quite a few new people. Um, and I want to give a shout out to my friend Jane, who's on the call, who uh, just signed up yesterday. So I just wanted to explain how the Nomadic Network works. We put on events two to five times a week, and they're all meant to like inspire your wanderlust and just like really expand what you think travel is and have you think about it in different ways and figure out different resources to use and all that sort of great stuff. And so Steve did an incredible presentation today just on changing your perspective. I love listening to you talk. So thank you so much for coming. This was his second event. His first one was just as awesome. And we're really happy to have you tomorrow night. We have this guy, Dylan, that wrote a book on Sealand, which is one of the tiniest countries in the world. It's a micronation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with micronations, but Rick, who's given the Counting Countries talk on the Nomadic Network, is going to be interviewing Dylan tomorrow, and it's going to be amazing. So I would love to see you guys there. We actually don't have that many people signed up, but it's going to be a phenomenal talk on a country that does not get any airtime. So that's going to be amazing. Thursday, we have Nomadic Matt, who's interviewing Steven from Walks and Bex from Intrepid Travel. Raise your hand if you've gone on a tour before, like on a travel, you know, a few day tour. What about a one day tour or a half day tour? So like, that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's the future of tour companies after the coronavirus, which hot topic now. Um, and then we have a California happy hour on Thursday night. And next Wednesday, we have Steven. Did, can you drop in the chat if you've been to either of Steven's other talks about moving to France? They are insanely incredible, filled with knowledge. He knows everything about getting a visa to France. And I feel like a lot of people are looking for other countries to live in right now. So I would really recommend um, coming to this on the 30th. And then we have Lola, who is just one of the best photographers ever, travel photographers ever, is gonna come and talk about how to sell your travel photography again with Nomadic Matt. If you can see that little picture of Nomadic Matt, that, that photo that's used everywhere on Matt's website and everything like that, that was actually taken by Lola. So it's gonna be amazing and I hope you can come to some of these events. Um, and again, you can sign up all of them for all of them for free at the nomadicnetwork.com slash events. And then I just wanted to invite you one more time into our exclusive Patreon community so that you could be a part of it. We have a really cool Facebook group. We have lots of freebies and you also get a lot of information that's not shared elsewhere. So for as little as $3, you could be a part of our like inner, inner, inner circle and really vamp up your nomadic network-ness um, and your nomadic madness. And so we'd really love for you to come. And if you just want to support us, a one-time donation is also like much accepted and very welcome. And so you could do that on uh, PayPal. And then I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. We love having you as a part of our community. Steve, thank you so much for speaking to everyone and for teaching everyone and you know everyone that showed up today it was just a pleasure you guys really lit up the chat you had so many comments you were really participating and that is just so fun because these virtual events can be 
dry sometimes and that is not the case for our community we are like on fire so <laughs> do you have anything you want to say steve before we close out no i just again we talk about this idea of appreciative inquiry and just having a positive approach towards it you guys you guys evidence that and not, not just tonight i've seen on other ones as well is there's just a real sense of you're in this for the passion and joy of it and you're supportive of each other and those of us who are speaking so just kudos to everybody and, and just my sense of great appreciation for for everyone tonight yeah thank you so much have a great night or day wherever you are thank you bye